Veggie Tales, a lot, a lot of times what we'll do is create a parody with a lesson. And Lord of the Beans, the lesson is about using your gifts. So it was equally important, or more so, to actually have the, the main character learn something. It wasn't really even possible to say, let's parody the actual story from the Lord of the Rings. So it was more about, let's parody the characters, the settings, the world, the feel, and kind of that sense of mission. We all have had a lot of thoughts about you know, how to make this you know, as meaningful as possible. That still had the same kind of epic feel, um, but was all based around one theme of, I've got a gift, what am I supposed to do with it? So what would you like to do with your gift? Casting is really important, you know, what character you choose to play a role. When you can get the right character in the right role, things really click. I think everybody in Lord of the Beans was generally happy about the roles they got stuck with. Uh, Bob was on vacation in Pensacola, Florida. He surfs and he tries to avoid sharks. My precious! There's a part of Lunt that really connects with that role. It's not a stretch. I was running around the room while I was writing it, just screaming as Lunt. And, and all those lines came out. Naturally, you know, something like, you know, a spork is, is got to be a bad guy. We're not saying that utensils are the bad guys, but you have to admit that spork and orc are very close. And for a vegetable, what could be more terrifying than a eating utensil that's a combination of a spoon and a fork, or a spork? They took the What Have We Learned song! I think really all we'll need is a batch of freshly baked cookies to coax the record away from the sporks. The script for Lord of the Beans called for a huge world, an epic world. We were very diligent to try to go no more than 10 sets for any given show. You know, in Lord of the Beans, when I first read that script, I counted like 19 sets. Each scene or each location had to have its own distinct feel. If it all looked fairly similar, you wouldn't get this feeling of, oh, well, they went, just went on this epic journey, you know, because it kind of looks the same as it did over there. We came up with some solutions by combining a bunch of sets. We reused a lot of sets in this show from other shows. For instance, we used, we reused the mountaintop set that was used in Minnesota Cuke. It's just kind of like having a backlot. I mean, movies do that all the time. All the major studios have backlots, and after they use uh, props and sets and things for shows, they, they store them and bring them out and dust them off and use them again. We do the same thing. With what Chuck Vollmer and Joe Spadaford did, um, going in, creating techniques for how to integrate um, you know, 2D and 3D to create this world that if we would have tried to build that all in 3D, would have just been so expensive and so prohibitive. A vicuna. A ring binder. A vespa. An elephant. We'll come up to a, a point in the script where, you know, we'll just have ad lib, you know, and so we'll just spend five minutes in the booth just goofing off, you know, and then, you know, and a lot of times that's where we get our funniest stuff. Ad libbing is a part of writing too, you know, because you got to come up with a thought sometime. I had some fireworks for my daughter's birthday, shooting them off in the backyard for friends and family. And I'm standing right next to the, to the garage, and I had this one that I didn't know what it was gonna do, so I light it, and all of a sudden it goes and starts spinning up in the air, so I dive into the garage and slam the door behind me, but it followed me into the garage. And the lights are off, and I'm like stumbling through the garage, just waiting for, is there gonna be explosion or what? <laughs> Fortunately, there wasn't a, a large report. I had to jump out of a boat once to avoid the potential of getting my hair caught on fire. <laughs> I've I caught some grass on fire before with fireworks, never, never anybody's hair. Mike was also in that boat. <laughs> you know, my job as a director is to protect the story, and what that means is, you know, if somebody uh, adds something to it, even if it's really good, but it detracts from the main flow of the story, and then it's my job as a director to, to, you know, pull back on that. But a lot of times, you know, an, anima an animator will get it, and they'll see something completely new in it, and they'll, they'll, they'll add to that, and it'll really work. One of the great surprises in Lord of the Beans was sort of the, um, you know, Larry's mouth in the silly song, you know, just that, kind of that Elvis snarl. If I was handsome, if I was nice. He's under this delusion that, you know, he's got this, you know, 
his baby elf that feels about him the same way that he feels about her, and it's just not true. We wanted to do sort of vintage Elvis, the earlier works that kind of had that rockabilly feel. And when I heard that, I just kind of, you know, I was singing along with it, and then I heard that little thing, and then I just started vamping along with that. Coming out of Minnesota Cuke, uh, we had all this exciting music and a lot of action and adventure. There was so much emotion in this story and so much depth to it, and the music really carried a lot of that. And the more I was writing, the more I was getting wrapped up into it and really enjoying what I was doing. Irish music has this way of, of being sad and happy all at the same time, and, and it just elicits that emotion. That sort of establishes the whole, the whole show. And we hear that theme interweaved throughout, and even comes back in at the very end, when the, the grass blooms and the trees blossom. Probably uh, one of the most dramatic little cues in the, in the show is the Sporks theme. I had written that for the show, and we kept pe pulling parts out of, out of it because we had to hear the dialogue and we had to see the action, which is understandable. That's what you have to do in a movie. So I just get my little 30 seconds in there at the end of the Sporks theme, and then Winona sings. Just remember why he gave the gift, it's a gift I give away. It's about love. This was a real treat to be able to work with Winona and uh, co-produce with Brian. At first, when we heard the lyrics to this song, It's About Love, we thought, well, do we need to focus more on gifts? What goes beyond that? We're using our gifts because of the love. It's about love. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Every gift is given for a reason. We can't choose which ones we get, only what we do with them. That's one brave flobbit. There, there's more than just you know being a professional boxer to, to be brave, or a race car driver, or doing something dangerous to get famous. That's not real courage. A real courage is, is going out of your way for something that doesn't benefit you. I think it's really um, important to not be alone in, in what you do, you know, to have the support of your friends and of your family and of your, of your community. And I think that's a great thing to see modeled in a film for kids, is a group coming together, you know, and they weren't fighting for something on their own, they were fighting for Toto to help him so he can accomplish his quest. I hear you figured out what your gift is for. I thought I had. But the elders were lying. It was a trick. I think it's really important for us to help our kids learn what their gifts are for, how God intends us to use our gifts. And I can't wait because kids get so many messages from our culture about how you use your gifts. Every cover of every magazine that screams to them when you try to get them through the checkout line, you know, it's just screaming selfish ambition and vain conceit is what will make you happy. That's why this is an important story to tell, to instill in children from a young age that the gifts that have been given them are for them to use, to use for the benefit of others. The bean is a metaphor for, you know, whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is. Try to craft a story that could make selflessness appealing, which is tricky. It's easier if you show the consequences of being selfish, if you show people being selfish and not getting what they want. But then we show Junior, who actually sees the good that his gift can do for other people when he uses it the way God intended it at the end, and he's filled with joy. I think each of us has their own special talent and ability, and rather, use, rather than using that ability to help ourselves, to make ourselves rich or to make ourselves famous, what God wants for each of us is to use that ability to help somebody else. I want to help people.